Thank you. Thank you. Variable fonts. Wow, that worked. I was, I was told that if I say this a few times during my uh, talk, I'm going to be able to get your attention. So every now and then, I'm going to say variable fonts and see if, that, if that's going to work. Um, but as you can see from my uh, title slide, actually, the topic is about the CSS working group. Um, and I'm hoping that the person that was just introducing me didn't almost give it all away, because <laughs> I wanted to give you an intro of all of that, but I don't think he did. So um, just before I start talking about the CSS working group, can I get an idea of who here knows what CSS is? Yes. That's awesome. Um, as we all know, CSS is a styling language used to style markup documents such as HTML and SVG, among others. And um, in terms of the CSS working group, who we are and what we do, um, answering this question really would depend on who you ask. Most web designers and developers out there will probably tell you that we are some secret Hello. society. Hello, yes, I'm here. OK, something is happening. Is this somebody offering help, maybe? <laughs> um, OK, let's actually continue. Um, so as I said, most web designers and developers out there uh, are under the impression that we are this little secret society that kind of meets at the tippy top of an ivory tower somewhere, and we are secretly weaving the way forward of the web. Um, if you were to ask our family and friends, they will probably have different things to say or think. But in reality, uh, we are a group of members participating in the CSS working group that is chartered by the W3C. Uh, the members of this working group are either representatives of member companies, such as Microsoft, uh, Adobe, Apple, Monotype, many, many others. We also have invited experts. These are experts who have shown great passion, knowledge, or care about CSS, and they really want to help us push CSS forward. So we have invited them into our group, and they uh, are contributing uh, alongside all of the members uh, on weekly basis through telcons, or a few times a year when we meet face to face and discuss different things in various locations, such as Berlin this time. And our charter is really to maintain and uh, advance and extend the CSS language. So we, our job is to work on CSS specifications. That's, that's all we do. And what does it mean to work on CSS specifications? Like, what, is it, what, does, that really, what does that really mean to you? Um, what I will do is I, I will kind of give you a, one example of what means to bring some idea and then make it into a spec and maybe even uh, have it as a feature on the web. So about a year, maybe a little over a year ago, uh, a few guys came to the CSS working group. They were members of the working group at the time already. And I think it was some, after some kind of type conference somewhere. I don't know which one. I don't know where. I'm not a type person. But I know that they came, and they proposed that we start working on variable fonts. Um, and we did. So they proposed a uh, property called font variation setting. They said, let's add it. And that will enable designers or font uh, sorry, uh, web developers to twiddle with the low-level directives of fonts. So in this case, I can specify width or weight with some values, and that will adjust the appropriate axis uh, of the font. Now, this particular example is a really bad one, uh, and I want to strike it out of your memory, uh, because font weight and font width have been supported in browsers for a long time. They are the same properties as font weight and font stretch. So whenever possible, please, 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 Use the properties that are already there. Don't use the low-level directives for no reason. So now what can I do with font stretch and font weight? You probably already know. 
um, I can use, uh, I can adjust the axis, and uh, if I was utilizing some new uh, layout methodologies like CSS grid in this case, using one single font, I can create a really cool pull quote like this one. And it gets better, of course, because the values of font weight and font strength are numerical. We can also uh, take that into advantage and animate them. And when you animate them, cool things happen. So really here, um, experiences that you can create with a single font are kind of limitless. Now, the next thing that uh, they propose that we do is we add a property called font optical sizing. And that ensures that weights carry a consistent mood and bar quality across different sizes. Um, so, for example, uh, in the Sitka font, as the font uh, gets smaller, the stroke width uh, will increase, as well as the X height will get taller to improve legibility. So that's really, really cool. Um, now, after we discussed all of these things at the face-to-face, -face, we agreed, we shook hands and said, yes, let's go ahead and add this to a spec that actually already exists. We have CSS fonts level four, and those properties are fitting really, really well there. Uh, then, after the properties were added, came down to the browsers. Slowly, but not that slowly for CSS, actually, features were started to be added to different to the different browsers. And as of this moment, we already are starting to see really cool support. So uh, Microsoft Edge 17 is going to ship support for both optical uh, sizing and font variations. Uh, Safari on both macOS and iOS is also sh shipping support for both of them. Chrome already ships uh, support for font variation settings, and I believe they're working on optical sizing. and. The good thing is that Firefox is also working on this. So I believe, I'm not going to sign them up for any work, but I believe that uh, by end of 2018, you should expect that they are supporting both of them. And, and that's really, really cool. Um, the one question that came over and over and over when I was discussing this with different people is, well, how do I know as a web designer if your browser or my users' browsers are supporting this? Uh, feature detection in CSS is done with at supports. You can test and see if font variation settings, normal, for example, is supported, and then you can add all of your variable font declarations in that body. Um, so I'm going to take the opportunity and invite you to visit the AKAMS variable fonts. You can learn a lot more about uh, proper CSS techniques, as well as some of the tools that you can use to uh, work and create variable fonts, and so on and so on. So in summary, that's kind of amazing, right? We took a little over a year. People came with a proposal. We discussed it. We agreed on it. The browsers went and did their work. They shipped it. And now designers and developers out there can start creating awesome experiences for all of our users. Um, so all you need is basically a little bit of CSS and convince few people, and it's done, right? Not quite. Um, it's not that easy. And to illustrate this, uh, I'm going to show you like a simplified stack of what the web stack looks like. So on the top, we have web content, which comes to users uh, in the form of HTML, CSS, and everything else. You already know that. Um, underneath, you have browser engines. They take all of the uh, streaming characters, and they turn them into pixels on the screen. That's our job as browser makers. Now, the browsers and the browser rendering engines don't necessarily have the fonts. They don't really deal with them directly. Uh, more often than not, they either rely on platform uh, abstraction layers or directly invoke APIs that are available through the operating system in order to load, render fonts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So really, the, the CSS, the spot for the CSS working group and the specs and, and the influence that we have is in the two upper layers of the web content by uh, influencing designers and uh, web developers or taking your feedback uh, 
uh, and working on specifications, as well as the browser rendering engine uh, engineers who are going to go and put the work to make this happen. This is where we work. This is our scope of influence. Um, the operating system, which is on the lower uh, spectrum of this uh, stack, uh, is not something that we directly influence. This is, this is uh, in a lot of cases, proprietary. But again, you're font experts. You already know that. So this is, in a nutshell, kind of what the CSS working group is, what we do, how we do it, and uh, what our charter is. Um, if you ask how to get involved with us, uh, you can start by following us on Twitter. Uh, we do announcements uh, of new things that we do and add on Twitter all the time. I also would like to ask you to go and uh, read our current work page uh, on the W3Org website that we have. This is a really good place to learn about the current status of everything that we do, what is happening, as well as what is not happening, right? Uh, because we have quite a bit of specifications, and not all specifications move at the same rate. And finally, if you are already a guru in CSS, and you know specific things that you want to come and help us with, come over and join us on GitHub. All of our work is public. All of our issues are public. We welcome opinions and suggestions from everyone. As long as they're done in respectful and professional manner, go ahead and add anything to our issues. We will listen. We will discuss your ideas. If you're really good, we will most likely also invite you to come and help us a lot more. So please do it. My name is Rostan Atanasov. I am an engineer on the Microsoft Edge uh, browser, and I'm also the co-chair of the CSS Working Group. Now, following me will be two more members of the Working Group. One of them is Elika Etemad. She is one of the invited experts. Uh, she's awesome, and that's why CSS is awesome. Um, she will talk to you a little bit more about CSS and a little bit in depth about CSS. And then Miles from Apple will come and dive deeper into the stack and tell you a little bit more about performance characteristics and the do's and don'ts of fonts. Okay? So thank you. <laughs> you want to come? Very short. <laughs> Uh, hi, can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, I feel a little short behind here, so I'm going to stand here. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, my name is Elika Etemad. I'm also known as Fantasy. I have been an invited expert in the CSS Working Group for 14 years. Um, that means I've written a lot of the specifications that you all depend on, from CSS 2.1, grid layout, to text spec, writing modes, uh, um, if you have questions about the spec, I probably know the answers. 
um, I wanted to talk a little bit about font metrics. I know they're not as sexy as variable fonts, but if you want your web page to look sexy, you need to have good font metrics. So um, we're going to start off by discussing, well, what exactly is CSS? And why is it different than designing for print? And why do we care so much about the font metrics? Um, so here's like a typical web page-ish looking thing. It's really simple. Um, the code that's behind it is a combination of HTML and CSS. HTML is a bunch of tags. You can see the content of the document is the same as the content in the code. The only thing I did was add some markup to say where the heading starts, where it ends, where the section starts, where it ends, et cetera. Um, and then the CSS is a bunch of annotations on what it's supposed to look like. That's the CSS. Um, the thing about CSS is that you, unlike print, where you design something and then you print it and then you're like, now everybody's going to see the thing I made and it looks just like this whenever I give it to them. Um, we don't know a lot of things when we're designing for the web. Um, a lot of times we don't know the content. Uh, we don't know the screen size or orientation, the aspect ratio. It could be anything. It could be printed out onto a piece of paper. Um, you don't know what font is going to load. So you might think you're going to get the font that you told it to load. You're like, I have a URL. You can download it, but maybe somebody's on a slow connection, and they're like, I'm not downloading your font. Sorry, bye. Um, so if you have designed your web page to be so precise that if the text is just a little bit bigger, it no longer fits, well, it's not going to fit anymore. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have a problem. It just means we have to be more creative with our solutions. This is um, a proposed design for the CSS Working Group from like 2011. And as you can see, we can do some things that makes it adapt to screen sizes. But we can make it adapt a little bit more. Here it's dropped to fewer columns. Now it's dropped to two columns for this float layout thing. And then this is all live. And then finally, one column layout for like small mobile devices. Uh, CSS has some very powerful um, sizing instructions, so you can say like what you want. This is this is supposed to be the same size as this. If I change the font, it, it will actually match the same size as the text because we decided to size it in terms of the text, and not an arbitrary value that happens to be the same size as the text. And so we can resize the page, and the relationships are kind of as they're intended to be, and they stay that way, even though it's fluid. So, but in order to do this, we need good font metrics. Um, so font, font metrics allow the browser to line things nicely. Um, as a disclaimer, CSS's inline model is a little bit weird and kind of not great in a lot of ways. We're trying to fix it. But if we want to fix it and give you guys all the level of control that you want in an environment where you don't have a lot of control, we need the numbers and the fonts to actually be accurate. Um, font metrics are things like the ascent and descent, which tells us how much space to reserve on the line, where the baseline goes. There's metrics for the underline thickness and its offset. You can, there's metrics for the offset of your superscript glyphs and how big they are. And we use these metrics for things like aligning drop caps so that they line up the way they're supposed to as opposed to not. Um, We've got units for cap height and x height, and we use these to line characters to other characters or characters to images and other things like that. I'm not sure what this one is. There is no metric that corresponds to this line. If you know what it is, I want to know what it is. <laughs> um, bad metrics are bad. You can. Uh, this is an example of somebody who designed a beautiful superscript and wanted to use it. And well, the f browser didn't have superscript glyph, the, the font didn't have superscript glyphs for brackets. So we ended up getting this result, which 
is not great because the font the, the browser tried hard. They tried to synthesize it, but that but the but the font said, well, my metrics are this is my subscript position, this is my subscript size, and it ended up not matching. So if your su if the sub superscript sorry <laughs> if the superscript position and size match, then the browser can get something that's a little bit close and it doesn't look as bad. Um, if we've got underlines, we can make sure they don't land in awkward positions like exactly here. Um, we can make sure if you have a cap height that's accurate as opposed to a little too high, then you can make the text align for your top caps. Uh, in this case, the browser thinks it's aligned because the cap they thought that you know the drop cap the cap height was up here so but it's not so um here's an example where we had different metrics for different platforms the web designer here was really unhappy with everybody involved um <laughs> so yeah we use a bunch of metrics put a little please pay attention to the metrics if you want your font to be used on the web we do a lot of automatic layout. You don't get a chance, the designer doesn't get a chance to tweak it afterward to make it look sure that it looks right. Um, and that's pretty much my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm Miles Maxfield, and um, I would like to talk to you about font loading performance. I am one of the members of the CSS Working Group. I am a co-editor of the CSS fonts specification. I did some of the things that Rossin told you about earlier today, um, and uh, I work on WebKit. I'm an engineer. I write C++ all day. Um, the uh, WebKit is a system framework. It's a web engine. It's the thing that you know turns text into pixels, and uh, it's an open source uh, project that uh, is part of iOS and macOS, and um, it is also used on other different ports. We have because we're open source, we have a community of developers of which I am one. Um, and uh, we all work together to try to uh, make WebKit as great as possible on the platforms that we are interested in. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the philosophy of uh, what we work on. The, there is one web, but there are many different browsers. And so the process of specification is we all, like, all the browsers have to kind of sort of decide uh, what it means when a website says, make a thing underlined, for example. Um, and there's this sort of common misconception that if a website doesn't work well on a browser, that it's sort of the website's fault. And that's not true, right? We, websites, like, it is important that websites uh, sort of match the way browsers work uh, to work well on browsers. But we browser engineers also change browsers to match the web. And that's super duper important. Another sort of piece is that because there are many different browsers, many different platforms, uh, you don't know exactly what uh, the environment is. And sort of every, everybody uh, in this uh, presentation has been saying that. In particular, this is really important. I want to make sure it's very clear. You don't know which fonts are being used on your website, even if you use at font face. Uh, this is particularly true for um, on, on iOS and macOS. You have things like content blockers, but also uh, fonts can fail to download for transient network errors. Like These things happen, and browsers need to be robust when they happen. And they will happen, and they do happen. So uh, for example, in order to make robust designs, um, the example Rossin gave about not using font feature settings and font variation settings uh, is really important where if you say turn on the, uh, the weight axis to some value, um, 
that if that particular font doesn't load and instead a different one loads that doesn't have the weight axis but is just a bold font, uh, the browser is not going to know what to do, right? It's not going to work. It's going to be bad. So uh, the reason that this is important is because these higher level properties give the browser more insight into what the developer or what the designer is actually interested in. And we need that because uh, there are all sorts of environments that uh, we're, we're rendering into. So about font loading, there are many different strategies uh, to use. I'm going to sort of go through a whirlwind tour of some of the things that I found to be successful. And I want to give sort of pragmatic view on them. So subsetting, uh, I imagine all of you are familiar with subsetting. Um, there's some caveats to subsetting. It's really great to cut down your font. On the other hand, it only works if the person who is doing the subsetting knows what the text is going to be, roughly. There are many websites that show content that users have created. There are many websites that have forms where users type in stuff. Uh, in these situations, you have to be very careful about how you do your subsetting, because if you do it wrong, you're going to get one character in the middle that's a different typeface, and nobody wants that. You also can simplify your outlines. This is, this is really dangerous, but it also can help. Uh, I imagine there are many d designers here, and when they hear me say simplify your outlines, they say, no, my precious outlines. Uh, and that's true. Like That's right. That's valid. Uh, there are some situations where loading performance is more important than typographical accuracy. Uh, that's not the common case, but it is one of the tools in the toolbox. Browsers have incredibly sophisticated caching mechanisms, um, but there is some uh, some uh, website uh, behavior that can help that. Proper caching headers really go a long way so that when users click on links and go to a different page on your website, uh, you don't have to download the font again. It makes everything way better. Uh, there are many different font formats. Some of them have, some of them are compressed, some of them aren't. Uh, WAF2 in particular is, is compressed, and uh, that's a really great thing. This is, I also want to stress the point that this is a, a trade-off between network performance and CPU performance, right? Decoding, or rather uncompressing a file takes some time. Downloading a file also takes some time. This is another one of the situations where the norm, the norm is that you're more constrained by bandwidth, but it is a trade-off. Um, many websites use, you've heard about this forever, I imagine, but many websites use different different um, fonts that are in the same family on the website. If there is a variable font version, uh, you can download one file and use it all over the website and then cut down on your number of downloads. Um, also, similarly, uh, there are collection file formats where if, if, you, if there are multiple fonts inside one file and the tables for the individual fonts are exactly the same, they can be collapsed. Uh, and that can save you uh, download, you can save you bytes when you download. The CSS working group yesterday resolved to add some syntax for the format keyword uh, that will allow uh, web authors to uh, specify that a particular font requires certain technologies. So you can say, only download this font if you have color support for the COLR table, for example. Uh, no browser implements this yet because it was resolved yesterday. Um, but this is really exciting. This, this will, uh, if, if this is used correctly, then browsers that don't uh, then browsers will download a font that doesn't have to include technologies that it doesn't understand. Uh, and similarly, because there are uh, so many file formats, um, I would urge you all to, because tools can emit many, many of these different formats, emit all of them and then sort them based on size and then include them all in your at font face blocks. And the browser will download the first one, which is, if you sorted them, the smallest one that it supports. There's also uh, a sort of a side topic about perceptual loading. This is uh, this may not actually, if you actually like take out a timer and calculate a wall clock time, uh, it, this this will not affect that, but it will affect your user's experience. Um, first thing is that usually you don't want to do anything. All browsers work really hard to make sure that the default behavior, if you just make an at font face rule, put a URL in it, uh, away you go. That's really great. 
Um, in fact, most, most browsers have this really great hybrid approach where they try to make their uh, behavior really great for fast-loading fonts and for slow-loading fonts, where they won't uh, make users wait forever for, for their content, but they also won't show uh, some flash of, of local font with, for every single remote font. If that isn't what you want, there is a, there's a descriptor you can put inside your uh, at font face block called font display. And this is super easy, and, it's going, and it uh, supports most of the behaviors that people want, uh, at least that we, people we have interviewed. Um, the, like, so the, the default case is, should be great for, for almost everybody. Of the remainder, who wants some other behavior, this single descriptor will get you almost all the way there. It, uh, you, it, it, uh, it takes a, um, a particular descriptor, and these are named behaviors. So you just turn on the block behavior, turn on the swap behavior. That's almost exactly what you want. But for the last 1%, there is a JavaScript API that allows the web author to have total control over every aspect of their font loading. This can be used to implement all of the other behaviors. Uh, if you want to do it yourself, don't do it yourself if you, if you can't, if you can get away with it. And um, it can also do things like uh, start an animation somewhere else, totally on your, totally else on your web page, in an unrelated element once all the fonts are loaded. Um, it can also do things like uh, when the font loads faded in with an opacity animation. Um, and this this also can be used to do things like uh, try to create a uh, fallback font if it's a variable font that matches the metrics of the font you're trying to download. Uh, so that's all I've got. Thank you.